within my constituency for facilities that would assist the clubs. Indeed, the constituents generally withhold some activity. I myself was a community leader before this dispensation, so I know what it is to want to be able to do things in terms of fundraisers. I heard it was said earlier about the interest in making money, etc. I thank your ministry, sir, for the project in terms of the mini stadia, which would give the people of Checker Hall and Fustic and the clubs there and also to the far east, my hometown, Pike Corner, the people at Charlie Griffith Center, etc., the ability to be able to raise funds even with the use of the mini stadia. It is not, as a matter of fact, it is an excellent idea. Honorable member, we have the privilege of being perhaps the third parish, with the, with the exception, of course, of St. Michael, where, where first class cricket is played at Kensington Novel, and then in St. Philip at Windward. We have had the privilege a few years ago to host first class cricket in the north of the country at North Stars in Crab Hill. We also have a very pristine facility at the Charlie Griffith Center named after that great West Indian who incidentally a, a statue will be unveiled in his honor on the 25th of this month. But what is lacking as we do all these wonderful things, the grounds at the Charlie Griffith Center is still without lights. The grounds at North Star's facility is still without lights. So with all that we've been able to do and we've been able to achieve, we still can only hold nighttime activity at the Checker Hall ground, a lovely ground, but I will come back to that because that is my second question. I want to know what is the program in terms of giving communities lighted facilities outside of the ministry because the ministry is but one, but we have, I have this particular um, situation which is perhaps unique to my parish, to my constituency, where we have two wonderful facilities, but the people can only enjoy them up to at least six o'clock on the evening. There's no activity in the east thereafter because we don't have those facilities. So I want to know what is the plan and if there are plans in terms of lighting these particular and other for similar facilities in particular because the, the, the Charlie Griffith Center is named after one of the West Indies greats and it would be befitting, sir, with the nice grounds that it is that you, we are able to have and based on what the community person, the persons in that community in particular are asking to have to bring balance to what is in St. Lucie because everything is on the west. There's nothing in the east. So I would like to hear your plans in terms of lighting facilities, not only in St. Lucie, but generally across Barbados. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. We have started um, a very aggressive lighting program uh, it is unfortunate, and I agree with you, that those areas that you would have identified um, should have lights. We have started a, that aggressive lighting programs to ensure that 
our youngsters who engage in sports um, have facilities that they can enjoy well into the night. Um, as I've mentioned before, resources, financial resources, would not allow us to do all that we would want to do at the same time. But I'm sure that plans are in train for your locations to be outfitted with lights at some point in time. But I will ask Mr. Matthias to elaborate in terms of um, maybe, if possible, timelines. But I know for sure that your locations are on the radar in terms of having lights. I almost thought for a minute there you were going to say that you only have access to the nighttime lights in the day, but anyhow. Good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, honorable member, um, the two grounds that you mentioned um, came under a unique, um, a unique, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Cricket season came up, and both grounds asked for the lights to be postponed because they're active cricket grounds. Um, same thing happened with YMPC. Um, Queen's Park, um, that is, um, Queen's Park is Spartan. Spartans. So because cricket season came up, those grounds actually asked their part of the lighting project to be postponed, essentially. And in that postponement is when the resources for that particular project would have ran out. Um, so based on what the minister would have said, it is still on the radar to be done. But once the resources that we have for it um, is, um, we get back the resources to complete the project, I'm very sure that those particular grounds um, will be put back into the lighting project um, as a whole. And just want to remind you, we do have some lights at Connell Tongue as well. Um, I, th I thought you may have forgotten that one. We I do am, have some I, lights at I'm, Connell I'm fully aware of what is at Connell Tongue, yes, but that, those are just small, for the small community. These two grounds have major activity. Yes, please. And ah. it just so happened, apologies for crossing you, it just so happened that it fell right smack dab into cricket season, and both of the, both of the clubs at the facilities had asked for a postponement. And because of that, we would have not had the resources to finish the project. I asked for, I also would, would want to remind, but perhaps you were not, I don't recall you being um, here last year, but I raised this same question, mentioned the same concern last year. I do not want to come next year and mention it again. So I'm going to hold you, Honorable Minister, and your team to your word. If you don't want every, there's a lot, a lot does not usually happen in the North, particularly St. Lucie. I don't jump up and keep enough noise or perhaps enough noise, but it, we are at the point, at that point, and I understand your explanation, but it is about time. We cannot continue, we, move, we are moving with just one facility for lights. And, and I'm not including Connell Town. Connell Town is a small community, small pasture, and the only thing they do is perhaps play football, not even cricket and they have some games. We also want to know that you mentioned that though the road tennis court for, 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 for Connell Town is due as well, right? My next question, I thank you, Minister. I see that you are about to change out the lights at Chaka Hall. Thank God. And I certainly appreciate that. Honorable Member for Christchurch East, I thank you for, I see the word start at Chaka Hall with respect to the changing out of the lights. And that will be highly appreciated. As recently as last night, I passed and the netball team there was barely um, able to see to practice. Two weeks ago, I was in the community speaking with the youngsters with respect to use of that facility and they indicated one no lights and two the grounds are in bad shape my premier football team youth milan 
have again, I said this last year, I come back to it again, have to go to Mahika Field in Spitestown. If I want to watch them play football, I have to go in St. Peter, and I have a lovely ground at Checker Hall. I have asked, I remember writing before your time, Honorable Minister, where, when Honorable Senator from another place was minister with respect to the regrading of this ground. Two years have passed and it has not been done. Minister, I'm asking you again, your team, to expedite this work so that Youth Milan, I won't have to go to Spikestown to watch football when my community, when, when the team from my constituency is playing, that I can be in check all mixing and mingling with the with the constituents and residents because residents followers are not gonna gonna go to another ground necessary to they got to lay football bad. But if they are at home, the support, the home support is very much there. So I am asking what are the plans for the upgrade? When you finish, the, when the lights are completed, I would like to be able to go and watch some football. I know that won't be possible because regrading of a ground takes a bit longer. But Minister, I want to hear from you. What are your plans with respect to the grounds at Chaka Hall? All right. Um, I feel your pain, Honorable Member, because I understand um, Part of the ministry is empowering communities and if you have if there's a team a local team and they're not playing within the community it will impact um i'm going to ask the director or mr matthias to answer your question is is this regrading that you're talking about for the location yes it is okay I, i'm going to ask um both or one of them to speak to you in relation to um timelines for making sure that this ground is sorted Thank you, um, Honorable Member for St. Lucy. Um, I just want to put in context um, the issue regarding the allocation of monies and so on by emphasizing the Sports Council's um, budget. Out of the $22 million we asked for, we received $19 million of that. Out of that 19 million, 6 million came in capital. 13 million um, was for <clears throat> operations and 10 million for salaries, which left us with 13 million. And of that 13 million, utilities was 1.9, electricity, water, and telephone, which left us with $1.1 million for maintenance, operational costs, and other programs. So it's out of that $1.1 million that we have to um, fight with um, to um, regrade uh, and, and do other projects on, on grounds. So we are challenged and we have to, to set priorities because there are other um, uh, constituencies that also require um, upgrades and, and redevelopment and so on. So I just want to indicate that despite Checker Hall is indeed part of the Mili Stadium, um, we would look at the regrade of the ground um, over the next financial year. Um, as Mr. Matthias would have indicated, um, Ignatius Bayer will be also look at in regard to lights because that's a very beautiful ground. And um, we believe because of the sporting community there that um, we, can, we can afford lights there at um, Ignatius Bayer. But we would look at the Chaco Hall ground um, over the next financial year. Thank you. Sir, you do mean the coming financial first April 2024 to 2025? Yes, that's when the financial year starts. Thank you. Thank you. I will hold you to that, sir. Honorable Member for St. Philip North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, maybe about two questions. I want to speak about and to inform the public from your point of view on the Resource Center for St. Mark's and the attached um, sports, sports grounds, the pavilion. 
I had met with some members, included here, of staff before you were the minister on for the entire ministry. And we had discussed plans for building out um, the hard court and other initiatives for the um, pavilion side of things. I just want to hear mostly for the benefit of the constituents what is planned and um, basically a timeline. Um, thank you, Honorable Minister. This, this is the community center or the pavilion that? Uh, we will, both, I will speak of both in tandem because they're adjacent to one another. So I'm speaking about right now the pavilion side of it. I had requested the completion of hard courts and, and as a team, we had both your team and, and me had come up with some suggestions on how to build out the sporting facility there. Okay. Um, Mr. Matthias, can you take this question, please? Good afternoon, again, everybody. Um, we are going to be doing your hard court in the next financial year, the financial year April to March 20, 2024 to 2025. And um, we actually actually have your Ground St. Mark's um, scheduled for a grade for this financial year, um, which will start very soon. Um, we've, as I said before, with other um, constituencies, we've submitted the um, purchase orders to the contractor, and they have in the, they actually started yesterday on the first one. So they will continue out, and your ground will be regraded, and your hard court will be looking at, at next financial year. All right, and oh, it's going to be a multi-purpose facility as well, um, similar to all the others. So basketball, netball, all the all the particular sports including rural tennis as well. Thank you very much. Really appreciative of that. The other part of it, the other half of the compound, the resource center, um, I visited um, there Friday, and I noted, like I have noted for a little while, the maintenance of the facility is fairly poor. Right now we're looking at of the, this is a guesstimate of the maybe six to eight, bathrooms about two of them are working and that has been a complaint for a little while we have progressed it is not really fit for purpose the building but i am seeing um community members using it for weddings and birthday parties and i think that is one of the things that i would like to encourage it can actually they pay for it putting some coffers into the the kitty so that it can maintain itself but the toilets are not working um the community center houses the a small credit union up there isn't it, it isn't under this government but the building really is not fit for purpose we had a computer program and this is one of the questions i have but your members were not able to answer maybe you can the computers were housed in a nearby building that is now basically dilapidated i'm not sure who the owner which ministry is the owner of the building um but right now it's People are taking advantage of what's inside. I'm seeing chairs coming out and destroyed, and the building is really a hazard if you're thinking about rats, but I'm not sure whose purview that is under. Uh, so with, between the credit union, people wanting to do classes, the kitchen facilities are in disrepair. Uh, the RO member for St. James North will tell you the, the ramp is there, but the door by which you can enter the building off of the ramp cannot be opened. Uh, locks are missing from most of the doors. It, it's basically in a state of disrepair going. I know the RMO member for St. Michael's Southeast had talk, sp spoken about the maintenance. What is on the cards for the community center? And when? Thank you for the question, Honorable Member. I will ask uh, Mrs. Keith from CDD to respond to you. A very pleasant good afternoon to everyone again in relation to the facility at St. Mark's. As you quite rightly said, that facility was open, that would have been in 20, I think it was 2017, 2016, 2017, and we've had challenges with that facility from the onset. The, yes, you spoke of, of the ramp, and I will address that. When the facility was getting ready to be handed over, I note that the ramp was built, but persons with a disability would not have been able to access the center because the ramp was not um, 
No, I don't have the technical terms, but the ramp did not go all the way to the doorway. So you will see there be, what we had to do in order to address that was to ensure then that the contractor had to come back and, and ensure that the slope was such that persons who, with a disability, and who would be using a wheelchair or have some type of disability, that they're able to access that center. What we have noticed is that because of the, and Rockfield is one of those centers, because we're impacted with the salt sprays coming from off of the sea, we found that those centers, and Boscobel, those centers are centers we have to treat, you know, periodically. What I have sought to do in the interim, the officer with responsibility for that center, minor maintenance, and of course, we have started that. So you should see, you should see some progress in relation to, have, to having the minor maintenance address. The facility, because of the age of it, not as aged as the, the other facilities which I'm treating to now, you would find that it is, I'm not going to say the worst, but at the same time, we have to address the needs of those which are in a, a more advanced state of, of disrepair. So we found that in relation to, to some centers, we had to approach maintenance in three phases, as I said this morning. And certainly, yes, whereas you can see the wear and tear on the, the, the St. Mark's Resource Center, Certainly we would treat to that, but that would be a level of minor maintenance in comparison to those other centers where we had to discontinue, you know, center use. And to speak to the building, the annex, that building was, we have the engineer's report as far as that building was concerned. We submitted the correspondence to the Ministry of Transport and Works, and of course the housing, because we don't have the, the technical assistance in order to have that building demolished. So certainly, we know it is an eyesore, but that along with, there's also one in Colleton, where we, we are saying that if we have not been able to receive the necessary assistance from government, then we would have to seek some private entities in order to ensure that we have those buildings demolished and you know, a safe space so that persons you know, can traverse that area. So in relation to, and you did speak of, of you know, seeing persons take out chairs, but those chairs are not, um, the chairs are not in use. So you would find that because we are, we don't have storage per se, so therefore, even in relation to those chairs which the backs would be broken, you know, the wheels, they've come off and everything like that. Obviously, we have to, and in some cases, and it has always been a challenge, and I've found it fairly challenging, but in the last four years, to actually carry out the repairs, because if we have a facility and we don't have storage where we can actually move furniture, which is still relatively good, into storage, so that we can carry out major repairs, that has been the challenge. On some of the locations, we opted and we said, well, okay, we would need to have, you know, rent a container or we would need to purchase a container. But as I said this morning, it is the maintenance of these facilities has been a challenge and we are addressing them, you know, incrementally, going parish by parish and ensuring that the facilities not um, sometimes in a parish you might have two or three facilities. So obviously we cannot and we would never, you know, press, take those all two at the same time out of use. So whereas, yes, we understand that, you know, you would have, like for instance in St. Michael, if we have the challenge and depends on the proximity, we have to sit and determine. So when we have taken this center out of use, then what are the, the residents, you know, how are they going to have their community interactions? And uh, we've had some challenges, because I, I had my share of challenges when the Rockfield Community Center, which is a center 
which was, was not in use from 2017. And, you know, we finally managed to have that up and, and functioning, I must say, having community activities, because one was down there last weekend. But there was some pushback from the residents, because understandably, we didn't have another facility, but sometimes in order to get to have, you know, at the end of the day, a good product, you need to be inconvenienced at some point in time. Thank you very much for your answer. If we could get to the bathroom facilities, though, um, a wedding is scheduled, I think, within the next two weeks, and the handicapped bathroom is not functioning either. So we, if we could skip over a couple, just to fix the toilets, I'd be grateful. So what I, what I can say to the maintenance as well, we've sought to, for this financial year, to establish a maintenance unit. That maintenance unit would treat to all level of maintenance because you would appreciate with close to 40 facilities and ensuring that members of the public are able to go in that we can treat to all level of maintenance. The challenge is that we were dealing with persons who are trained in social work and if we employ the services of a plumber, we have to rely on the plumber's word that the plumbing has been fixed effectively. And we found that Yes, sometimes, you know, it is, it is not, you know, usually what is reported. We did have substantial plumbing carried out on that facility that was last year. We did have some substantial plumbing done there, but certainly the matter is, I would seek to address it as soon as, you know, I get back to my office this afternoon, or this evening, rather. Thank you so much. Um, that is the end of my question, really. I just want to offer condolences to you, Minister, and the rest of the team for the loss of your workmate. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, just one note to say that, look, um, you've heard this morning and this afternoon about the level of uh, repairs. This is something that we inherited. You know, so we're now working in a systematic way to try to rectify the problems at all of these pavilions and community centers that were neglected for ever so, so long, yeah? Thank you. Thank you, honorable member. And let me add, it slipped me not a few minutes ago, honorable minister, but I want to thank the community development officer through you for the excellent work done at Rockfield in St. Louis with the restoration of that wonderful facility, which we certainly plan to utilize to its fullest. At least there's something in the East for us. Honorable member for St. James South. Thank you very much, Chair. I would like to start by stating that from my perspective, the work of the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Community Development... Honorable Member, come closer to the mic. I'm sorry? Speak up. Here is good? Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to start by outlining that from my perspective, the work of this ministry is extremely critical to the future of our country. It is also critical to the success of our young people. And because they are our future, I believe that every effort that we make in order to enrich and empower their lives is going to be important. I recognize from what I've been hearing so far that there are challenges with resources, with sufficient people, and so on, to be able to execute the program that is needed to be done in order to achieve the objectives of lifting the youth of our country. Therefore, for me, collaboration across ministries and collaboration between projects, to me, would be essential and important. Um, I was jolted um, today by the news concerning what would have happened, I believe it was yesterday, with the children from a school where the stabbing took place. 
and not that we don't know that there, there's difficulty and crime and violence, you know, with our young people and our children. But that just brought into sharp focus how urgently we must work. So one of the things that I want to raise with you is the issue of what it is we're doing in relation to the camp program, the summer camp program. The truth is, schools by themselves cannot manage everything. Parents by themselves cannot manage everything. But I think that working together on a, on a, a, a coherent program will help. And the camps is an essential tool that we can use. I know what it did for me to go to a camp. It often represented a moment of change for me. I heard something or interacted with somebody that gave me another piece of the puzzle to put into my life to help me move forward, and I'd be forever grateful for it. I feel that if we take the camps, so I want to know about what is it we're actually teaching and focusing on in the camps, because I would like it to go beyond keeping children busy during the summer so that they're out of trouble, but rather that there is a planned and focused program for what it is we want to create in our youth. And if you could start with that, I would then like to make a suggestion about something else that I feel could be added to the program if you don't already have it. So. All right, thank you, honorable member. Um, you're absolutely correct in relation to the importance of the summer camps on the landscape of this country. And we are doing what is necessary to ensure that our youngsters during the summer have the very best of what is available to them in terms of those summer camps. And I will ask the director to take this question, but before he comes in, I want to share with you that you're absolutely correct. And the ministry is very proactive in terms of collaborations. And we would have sent um, letters to the necessary ministries that we, we figure can impact on our work so that we can have a point person in those ministries when we need the assistance to um, assist us. So we are working in that direction. Director. Thank you, Cleaver Hunt, Director of Youth Affairs. And uh, thank you, Minister, for the question for the summer camp. And uh, for just to say that the summer camp is an extremely valuable uh, tool that we use um, to enhance the social development of our young people. And what we do in the summer camp is to provide a structured environment for those young, young, young children between ages four to 15 years. And uh, we put them in a structured environment away from the rigors of academia and expose them to more experiential type exercises in order to allow them to engage in those types of activities um, that will allow them their social development, enhance their life chances, uh, and so on. Um, so our program is basically based on sports, exposing to sports, expose them to the arts, music, some literature, dance, film, some agriculture. And uh, I must even put in a, a plug for our digital media program where we won gold at NIFCA this year, bronze and silver. So that was an extremely um, good performance by those young persons who were involved in the National Summer Camp um, during the course of the last year. And that is something that we have said that we wanted to be able to target in terms of the young people so that we can make sure that we're enhancing the development and that they are contributing to national development activities. Um, this year, um, we are looking at reviewing the curriculum that we have had in the camp because we have been doing this curriculum for an extremely long time. And we are looking at how we can enhance the contributions that we are making the inputs that go into the summer camp program. And therefore, we are looking at how we introduce more technology-based um, type activities into the um, summer camps, um, along with some of the other things that we have been doing in the past. Um, this year, we are looking about to go about 50 camps um, across the various constituencies across the country. 
And the target is about 4,000 young people that we are looking uh, at this year. So yes, Minister, we agree with you that the camps are really critical because what we have envisioned is a model where we are working with young people continuously. So we are doing that type of reinforcement with the young people as they come year after year to the extent that the pro-social um, development side is one that we are looking at to enhance their overall development. I would wanted to get um, something a little more. I, I understand the set of activities, but what are the underlying goals that you have? In other words, how have you structured the program laid out for our, our young people to include values training, discipline, conflict management, those types of things? What are the specifics that you are aiming for in the activities you're exposing the children to? so that we can begin, we are planting seed that should eventually give us a harvest as they grow older. And I want to thank you, Minister, also, too, because you did expand on some of the things that we have in the program, things like conflict resolution, um, discipline, um, exposing them to the history of Barbados so that the treasures, the national treasures um, of Barbados through the tours and so on that they may undertake. Um, so these are the kinds of activities that we are doing um, with these young children um, in the summer camp um, program. I hope I answered your question, but there are a number of things that we do which um, add to the overall development of these young people, these young children. Okay. Um, oh. Sorry. The minister also know that there's no longer $5 million attached to catering. <laughs> I, I, just saying. Just saying. <laughs> Um, just as a follow-up, though, to that, if you could also add what you do in terms of training your camp counselors, and um, one of the programs that I wanted to see incorporated into the summer camps was one on law and order, but we wouldn't call it that because it's not attractive for digestion. But I find that today, Many Barbadians are imbibing the notion, I can say what I like, I can do what I like because I'm a self-regulating person. I, I, I can make my own decisions. And therefore, you have this dysfunction now that's going across the society as these varying wills clash in issues big and small. And understanding the importance of rules and laws and what role it plays, I don't think that we've successfully communicated that to our children. That, for, for example, if you're eating lunch at home with six other persons around a table, then we pass the dishes and we serve ourselves and we eat. But if you have 100 people to serve and you set up a buffet line, there are rules. Otherwise, it cannot be achieved successfully. We have not sat and explained to people why we do things a particular way and why we don't do things a particular way. And as long as they don't understand that, they're just going to feel it's a, a, something that we have put on them because we feel to, because we've not explained its importance to their lives. So one of the things I would love to see developed is a program of teaching concerning rules and values and social interactions, why it is important. And if we can, in, if we can include that in our summer camp program, I think that that would go a long way. And again, the collaboration with the Ministry of Education to look at reinforcing all of those things together that you're working on the same trajectory in terms of helping our children to understand these basics. So if you could speak to the training of your counselors and what you think about the possibility of a program about law and order. Yes, thank you, uh, Minister. Yes, um, as the Minister would have pointed out, all of the counselors that we have in the National Summer Camp Program are volunteers. So what we do is to ensure that every single person who comes in to work with the, with, the, with the kids are actually trained. So we have developed a training program. We have a training manual which we use to um, impart that training to those persons who are volunteers. And we ensure that those persons who come in 
if you don't have the training, we are not putting you in the camp. Because certainly, um, one of the things that we look at, we have in the training also too, is this whole um, area of safeguarding. And we want to make sure that the children, when they come into the camp program, that they have persons who look after their welfare. In fact, that's big for us because we want to do our due diligence to ensure that the kids come to no harm. We bring them in an environment which we have already, you know, theorized and hypothesized that if they come into this setting, they are going to be in a good place, as opposed to being outside in the communities where they're exposed to any type of harm or the risk factors of harm. So we do training with all of those um, volunteers, some social work training about the care of the children from the different age groups that will come in, so that when we do the allocations of, of our camp assistants, that we are allocating them to, to in areas where they have actually been done the training um, in. We do training in first aid um, because we have to ensure that if there's an incident on the, the, on, the, on the camps, any of the campsites, that we have people who are ready and willing to be able to assist um, those children as well. We do training also too in different types of programming because what we want to ensure is that all those persons are able to deliver programs that are age appropriate, all the camp counselors. And therefore, we put them through that kinds of training where we teach them different um, methods, different activities that they can employ within the camps that will allow them to work with the children in a way that brings value to the lives of the children. What we don't want, uh, Minister, is a warehousing of children. I think we have resisted that in the ministry, um, too for Neil, we didn't put it that way. And I think what the minister said is also important, not from the point of view of lunch, but from the point of view of the monies that is allocated to camps to allow us to put in the types of inputs that we can bring value to the lives of the children. And every time we ask for any increase, it's about that. Because we want to ensure that the types of programs that we are bringing are ones that are going to, as I said, improve the lives of the children, do the types of things that you're asking, um, um, uh, Minister, because as a Division of Youth Affairs, we are also conscious of the fact that the social conditions have changed significantly, and therefore we have to respond with the types of programming that will allow us to address the challenges that we are facing um, at the moment. I know we only have three minutes, so I don't want to go on, but. We can discuss this, Minister, observe that, and the, the, the support that you bring, because as you know, I have visited camps in your constituency um, in the past where we have done a lot of artwork and where we have displayed and bring the parents back to show them the work that the kids have done, and these have been fantastic programs that were well received by the parents. So your suggestion for law and order even though we cover some of these things under our disciplinary training program within the summer camps, it is something also that we can look to build out even further given what we're actually seeing in the communities as the types of, um, you know, deviance that is being presented and, you know, the, all the breakdown, as you, you're saying, in some cases in law and order that is impacting on our children. Thank you. Hope I answered the question. Yes, you did, and thank you very, very much for that. I want to shift now to sports. I was very happy to hear about the work that we're doing in relation to sports and the fact that we're looking at the community um, sports program, we're a coaching program. This is something that I've been looking forward to because COVID had quite a tremendous impact on our young people not being able to get out, not being able to continue their sporting program and therefore its resumption is very, very well received by me. However, there are some issues if we are to make it work and if we are to keep sending to the, a message to our children that they are important to us and that the programs we put on are because we consider them to be important has to do with the state of the pavilions and community centers. I know you've addressed that already, but I want to speak particularly about St. James South. I've got a pavilion that needs some work. So I'm hoping that it will be on somebody's list 
to do the necessary renovations that will help us to give them a facility that says to them, you're special and you're important to us. The, one of the main challenges in terms of the physical facilities for us has to do with the Lakers um, basketball team, a national team that does very well. And they play at the Husband's Exercise Park there just off Oxner's main road. And they are in urgent need of changing facilities there so that because they practice two, three times a week, but there's nowhere that they can go to the bathroom. There's no place for them to change. And we need to be able to get facilities there. And then we've also asked the ministry about the St. John the Baptist um, Old Boys School that used to be a police post about the potential for renovating that into a community center because St. James has 23,000 people. Weston is the only resource center. Um, it's too far away to make it useful to the rest of us who are further down in St. James. And we truly need truly need some kind of community center that we can use for the 23,000 people that live in St. James and the 10,900 in St. James South. Um, thank you, Minister. I'm not sure if the area um, where Lakers practice is state land. Can you say? If, is it state land? Where Lakers practice? Practice, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, all right. So um, we can look at the possibility of putting the bathroom facilities that you're requesting at the location. Um, I don't see it as being a major problem. Uh, Mr. Matthias or the director can speak to that. The other area that you talked about, I remember doing the site visit with you um, at that location, but I am not sure. <laughs> Uh, what is the status in terms of having the property turned over to us? Uh, I believe that the Ministry of Housing would need to be involved in the process in terms of having that turned over to the Ministry so that we can look to um, do some retrofitting at the location to bring the building up to scratch in terms of making it a community centre for you. So we will investigate and see what is the position if the Ministry of Housing would have to um, vest the property in us, or what exactly is required to, to move it. Uh, but I will ask Mr. Matthias or the Director Morel to speak on the possibility of um, constructing that washroom facility at the Lakers main area. Hey, good afternoon, Honorable Member. Um, we will look into it, definitely. Um, it is not something that was on our scope, but um, on, our, on our recent school. Um, but we will definitely look into it, come up with the costs, and make the necessary adjustments and presentations that we will need to get the, the monies to do it. I'm looking forward to that. If you need me to help you push for the resources, please say so early. I will, I will do what I need to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And my last question. St. James South is primarily senior, 10,900 people. And of that number, over 6,000 are above the age of 50. And close to 5,000 are over the age of 60. It's an aged community. And therefore, under the issue of um, technology, community technology program, my seniors are in urgent need of training in technology because if they're going to live independent lives within their communities, if they're going to remain safe, and if they're going to be able to transact their business with minimal disruption, minimal pain of getting up, going out, catching a bus, or trying to drive, or waiting for somebody to come to take them, or paying a taxi $60 to go and transact business, technology is going to be very important to them. I know that a lot of the focus of the ministry is on youth. However, with an aging society and the community development program and the 
technology program, I would like to think that my seniors could get in there at the same time. And another thing I would like for my seniors is we are trying to do an exercise track for them at the Husband's Exercise Park. The reason being, when they walk on the road, they are at risk of the fast driving. And you know, as you get older, you're not as steady on your feet. You could easily off balance. If you look over your shoulder too quickly, you could off balance. And the sidewalks are not the best. And we have to work on those. But I believe an exercise track will be a much safer thing for them at the same Husband's Park. And I would welcome if we could get anything for them there. And the last thing would be skating. I don't know, I understand that you're looking at cheerleading, but I would like you to look at skating as well. That has become very, very popular in Barbados. But, ah, uh, my, uh, yes, over 40s, 50s, and 60s, I went and I took a look myself. And let me tell you, the middle age and up are skating as well. And uh, we also have some young people doing it. And I have a number of my constituents asking um, about skating facilities because they need a smooth concrete rink so it doesn't damage the, the, the wheels, right? Right now, they try to use schools that have wooden floors, but schools are heavily used and they cannot always get them with the frequency. So I would like to know if there's any plan or preparation to facilitate and advance this particular new sport in Barbados, especially for the seniors who are looking to enjoy themselves. All right, um, thank you. I, I'm sure the honorable member to your right is very, very pleased that you're making a case for uh, the elderly. Um, we, are not, we are not averse, um, honorable member, to um, engaging with the elderly. I, I'm looking at my notes here and our elderly swim program for this financial year, 1,097 individuals would have been engaged in that program at Brown's Beach. Thank you, member. <laughs> um, yes, we are working in collaboration with the Ministry of Environment in, in, as it relates to the swim program. Now, I know before going to the ministry that at some point in time, the community development had programs where persons in the age range that you're identifying were able to source training um, in a range of different activities as it relates to um, using the computer. I will ask Ms. Mrs. Keat to, to comment on some of the programs that the elderly can be involved in as it relates to what you're suggesting, but I will also ask the Sports Council to respond to you from the sports perspective. Good afternoon again. Thank you, Minister. In relation to programming for seniors, we've now, in some of our community centers, we've now started the, we have three seniors groups. Because we realize that this lends critical support to those seniors in the communities. So therefore, yes, I know you don't have a facility or a dedicated facility, but what I can do and what I can suggest, you know, we can work together, see if we can identify a location. Because if we can identify a location outside of having that community center which you, you know, desire at this point in time, then we can mobilize the communities in relation to those seniors. And I think you did ask the other question in relation to the community technology program. And certainly, in relation to that program, and I, I would have spoken to, to Minister concerning this, is that we have purchased some laptops. Rather than you know, having a stationary facility now with, in a day where we can actually you know, purchase those laptops and we can take those to locations where we can then implement that particular program, break down the actual you know, resource room. At the end of the day, you take the laptops and therefore you know, everything, all of the training, everything would have been implemented at that point in time. So this is one of the suggestions now because we are looking at 
having like multi-purpose facilities and not just a facility now dedicated for the computer technology program. So certainly, with your suggestion, realizing that there is, you know, the deficit and there's a need for that type of activity, I would certainly, you know, engage you after this meeting so that we can plan the way forward for your constituents in St. James South. Well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to, oh, sorry, someone else was speaking. Where's oh, sorry. oh, you're the one who's going to build my community center for me. Uh, not, not the community center. Actually, you can the speak sports towards uh, roller skating. Okay. So there are actually um, quite a few of our hard courts and the car park, the gymnasium. So London Moore Tower hard court, um, the core park, the car park at Bleming, uh, Ivy. Um, um, Silver Hill Hard Court. Um, there are quite a few of sports council um, hard courts that are being used for skating, including our car park, the gymnasium. Uh, what I would invite the, the wider community of skating to do is to form an association, because we, we, we would recognize an association, and that will be the, I guess, the driving force to that facility that you're asking for. To, to, so, most of them are just persons that come together to form, I guess they call mini clubs to do the skating. Um, so they come pay for their tokens and utilize it after hours because that's mostly time that they have free. So if they could come together and form an association or some, some sort of recognized and let us recognize them as an official association, that would give them the actual voice now for us to um, possibly build out a facility towards that sport. And, if you look at it internationally, skating is a, a, a thriving sport internationally. Just it's now picking up here in Barbados. It's always here in Barbados. So I believe that that's something that can be looked at as well. Thank you very much. Um, if, if you could also look at the old stadium that you're not using right now and people could use it to do some skating. If it's suitable, I don't know. You, you all are the experts, you'll have to tell me, but I really need some place for them to skate that's close by, because they're really keen on it. So let me thank you, everyone. I look forward to the further conversation so that we can implement the things that will help the good people of St. James South to be able to be a vibrant part of your program. Chair. Thank you, honorable member for Christchurch West Central. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, let me also extend my condolences to um, the entire ministry on the loss of, I will uh, venture to call his name today, uh, Victor Bovell, whom I know personally um, from working in um, First Youth Service and now the Youth Advance Corps. I'm a tremendous youth advocate and um, disciplinarian, uh, a man who gives selflessly towards the build out of our young people. And I want to, um, to say today that um, his work certainly has not gone unnoticed, and it would be a big shoes for anyone to follow in his footsteps. So my heartfelt sympathy to him and his family, sir, and the family of the Ministry of Youth. Um, <clears throat> my questions will um, touch the various dimensions of this ministry, um, youth, sports, and community empowerment. Uh, there is a famous quote um, by none other than Oliver Holmes, who said that former Supreme um, Court Justice of um, USA, who said that their mind stretch with a new experience once it is good, will never go back to its old dimension. And I reflect on this saying, this maxim I may call it, when I look at the Youth Advance score. Minister, we came to governor in 2018. The vote is now um, buried in the history um, books, something called the Youth Service which we recognize was not fit for a purpose for the new generation, which did not meet the ideals that we, as we set out um, as a government, which did not have the philosophical intention to build out our young people in the way that we expect them to be built out. 
We said as a government that we will ensure that young persons in this country will not only be recognized for their worth here in Barbados, but of course, to be world leaders. And we made a determination as a government that we must come up with a program, not only a change of name, but a change of construct which will reflect the aspirations of our young people. Where 60% of our young persons who, leave, who um, leave school were telling us that they have a burning desire unequivocally to be entrepreneurs. They were telling us that they want to be able to venture a training program under the guidance of your ministry to be able to enter the world of work at the end of such program. And we are saying that um, back then, we were um, having about two or 3,000 persons coming out of school every year with no hope for their future Barbados, where they will become part of the tangible state. And we decided as a ministry and as a government to venture into a program that would allow at maximum about 2,000 persons a year to be able um, to fulfill their dreams. I want you, uh, Minister True, obviously, the probably director of the Advanced Score, to be able to expand on the programs that you have there. Um, the new programs, I know you are, you've started artificial intelligence. You have started um, new technological programs to be able to uh, facilitate persons to the world of work, rather in the armed forces or whatever. I want you to fully elucidate on those programs so that the young people in Barbados in their shop will well appreciate the fact that this is a program that they can see a future in. Minister, over to you. Thank you, Honorable Member, for your question. Um, I will ask Director Haynes, um, who's the parent, in a sense, of this program, to speak to you about the youth advanced score, and then I will ask Ms. Boyn to speak to you in relation to a program that is basically fused to that, um, the employability program, to give you a snapshot as to another area of the ministry where we're impacting the lives of young people. Director? Good afternoon again. Thank you, Minister. To expound on the Barbados Youth Advanced Score in three minutes is almost impossible. But I'll try to give a synopsis of what we have achieved under the Barbados Youth Advanced Score since we were established in 2019. To date, we have facilitated six cohorts, some 930 persons, 619 males, 311 females in our training program. Our program has been specifically designed to ensure that we build out the capacity of each and every trainee who participates in the program. So just to give you a snapshot on what we have achieved um, probably in the last financial year, um, we have we introduced a, a BYAC City and Guilds program that gives those young people who came into the program an opportunity to get certification at the level of a city and guilds, which is um, certificate in English and mathematics. We will also continue our CHC program, which was under the previous program, but we have expanded that to increase a range of CHC subjects, which include English language, IT, office administration, principle of business, social study, electronic documented preparation, physical education and sports, human and social biology, theater arts. We have expanded those programs and the results have been phenomenal over the last financial year. For example, in our City and Guilds program, we've been able to secure 87% pass rate. These are young people who have never hitherto had the opportunity to sit and enter an examination at their secondary school. And that was phenomenal. We, in relation to our CXC program, we've had significant um, results for the CXC program. And that has to do with the type of commitment for the staff and the academic program. So we had some 69% pass rate in the 2023 um, June CXC exams. 
in the June 2023, we had a 100% pass rate in the city and gives examination. I mean, for nominal results, we're giving young people that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Our program is also includes technical and vocational training program. We've had com significant success. The young people at the level of BIMAP, SJPI, Barbados Community College, is essentially um, Barbados Vocational Training Board. And we have uh, facilitated during the last financial year, several of our young people have been graduated. And even one of our students got the award at BCC for the most outstanding student and opportunity that was given to them. We, during the last year of financial year, we had a graduation ceremony. We have graduated um, some 100, 168 young persons comprising from cohorts three and four, uh, a graduation rate of 72%. So the program has been very successful since it was launched in 2019. But we, more importantly, we continue to work with our young people as it relates to job, job, job experience. And I, I'm pleased to report that during the last financial year, we had some 100, 124 trainees spanning cohorts three to five, comprising of 88 males and 46 females who were employed in various employment exercises, both in the public and private sector, spanning construction, hospitality, security, administration, and retail. And, there, and we still have relationships with the Sanders Barbados and related to hospitality training. So a lot has happened, Minister, during the period since we established the program, and we continue to work steadfastly to ensure that every trainee at the Barbados Youth Advanced Corps reach their full potential. I hope I did not go past my three minutes limit, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Boyan. Good, good afternoon, honorable members. Elizabeth Boyne, Senior Youth Commissioner. I just want to offer um, some points on the employability program and the success of this program. Over the last financial year, we would have seen 621 young persons facilitated under the employability initiatives in the ministry, 368 females and 253 males. Um, with the expansion of these programs, we would have done satellite locations to facilitate persons at the community level gr gaining greater access to the programs. And you would appreciate that the program focuses a lot on soft skills development, life skills, and opportunities for short-term, medium, and long-term employment. The success of the program, obviously, is based on rigorous and robust engagement of employers. So we value the relationship that we're able to engage with employers um, through sectors. We have managed to penetrate a number of sectors and have very good relationship with certain sectors, including tourism and hospitality the retail sector, the financial services sector, and even as far as the Barbados Police Service, who we have done a number of employability engagements with. As it stands right now, we have also ventured into the, fit, the schools where we are currently running programs with the fifth and upper fifth students to help them to transition into the world of work in terms of CV writing. We've also had um, partnerships with forged partnerships with a number of our sister ministries. Certainly, um, we're looking at a proposal on the table with the fisheries division, where we've had some dialogue with the Western Fisher Folk Association, Barnufo. We're also looking to engage, um, certainly, um, the Ministry of Agriculture. We've had some dialogue with them. But all in all, we're we are looking to build out further partnerships that would allow us to increase opportunities for apprenticeships for young persons. And in those apprenticeships, we're looking at some hands-on skills such as boat and yacht maintenance, seamen and fishing vessel operations, and other areas that currently aren't being tapped in. So that is my um, contribution to what we're doing in the area of employability. Um, 
the director, I know that you are a fellow who have uh, reservations when it comes to being boastful. But I would also want you to, to be able to tell the rest of Barbados um, that you have community engagement programs as part of the social development aspect for the young persons at the Youth Advance Corps. I know that you would have been engaged in both ecological and agricultural projects as part of the build out of the green environment. And of course, I know that your young people would have ventured into different areas, um, different disciplines around the community, getting that experience so that at some, at some point in time in their um, career choice, they will have the discipline of the armed forces because that is the type of training that you um, instill in them. I know that this happens at the Youth Advance Corps. I have been there along with yourself. My second question, um, Minister, I know that you would have spoken limpidly about our indigenous road tennis. You spoke about the fact that it has international appeal and it went as far as Rwanda and that at some point in time, there is going to be an international tournament which will um, allow persons from as far as, back, as far as the South to come and be part of this noble sport that we call our own road tennis. But, and I know you told me earlier that you have a story to tell, but there's a story of cricket, which is an exciting story for us Barbadians and us West Indians, albeit that we are not doing as good as we used to do 40 years or so ago. Um, cricket is really the one sport that has carried us across the globe in an international sense. I know that you have started because most of the famous cricketers started from small communities, small areas. At that point in time, they had a back, some of them made up of um, the coconut branch, and they played with them from marble balls back down. I know that cricket meant a lot to us in small communities, and it helped to, um, build Barbados and carry us around the globe as global leaders. I want to know from you, because I'm aware that you are, you are about to start your program, if it's not started as yet, where you will go into communities looking for this raw talent, to be able to nurture this talent so that we can once again be at the forefront of um, cricket and cricket development and as the world leaders so that we can advertise that not only Barbados but the West Indies is the best team in the world. So you can tell me what you're doing at the community level in terms of cricket and a cricket competition and tournament to, be develop, to develop those young cricketers. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Honorable Member. You are correct that cricket is really a staple as it relates to sports on the island. Uh, embedded in our sports policy, we have dedicated um, or identified cricket as one of the core areas that we will focus on in terms of a couple of areas, in terms of monetizing cricket, uh, using those icons who reside on the island to be able to ensure that we can benefit in a significant way from what they would have done in the past. Our community sports program is one that is rolled out across the island where um, every financial year we start a program with several different disciplines and cricket is one of those. We have restarted the, I believe it's called the Herman Griffith um, competition that was on pause be because of COVID and that is also coming again where a number of the primary schools, if not all of them, are involved in this particular um, discipline. In addition to that, very soon, very, very soon, you will see the launch of a junior cricket academy at the old um, headquarters for the National Sports Council, where we have five cricket pitches that are being prepared for that particular um, project. We are also looking to purchase some of the best bowling machines at that location. And this academy is predominantly for our young people. Uh, we will not stop a cricketer who wants to come and get in some net practice from using the facilities. But that particular location is being engaged as the incubator for cricket on island. 
So those who are interested in being involved in cricket at a serious level, um, that cricket academy at Blenheim will facilitate all of the training that is required. And I, I, I keep having to mention this, that we are not only looking at um, going into the nets and being able to bowl and bat, but things like financial literacy and media um, awareness, all of these will be embedded in the program in terms of that holistic uh, development of the youngsters who will be participating at the Cricket Academy at Blenheim. Thank you, Minister. I know you started off by saying that you have a story to tell. And I want you to tell the story of the community centers because and prior to uh, 2018, um, there was a situation where community centers were used for constituency councils. And um, it was not what we will call in Barbados fit for purpose. Um, you have done a lot of work. Um, your department, albeit that I would want to make a special call for um, the community center in Sergeant's Village, which straddles three constituencies, um, the Christ, constituency of Christchurch West, the one of Christchurch East Central, and the fulcrum of Christchurch, Christchurch West Central. And <clears throat> this, this is called the Old St. Dosa Pasture. Those persons who are now recognized as in the twilight of their years will remember it as the Old St. Dosa Pasture. And, I, and, and, and these, this, this pasture was able to produce some famous, not only footballers, cricketers as well, the likes of Zarts, and they will call their name Zarts, and Wees, and they have Ward, and, and, and um, even Junior also, who went on to play for Barbies as a goalkeeper. Um, it was able to, to, to produce um, Santa, I may call his name, Pika, all those people renowned in Barbies in the football and the cricketing fraternity from this little, small, two by four pasture. We, I am making a special appeal and they're doing every single thing that the member of parliament for Christchurch West said in terms of having that facility repaired to save um, the sporting fraternity in Christchurch. I'm begging. But as I said, we have a story to tell in terms of the community improvement and work and rehabilitative work that we have done since 2018. And I want you to tell your story through the voice, of course, of your acting chief community development officer our community empowerment, because it's really getting the community together to be able to empower, empower themselves to have a tangible existence in a community. That's what the empowerment and development to me is about. And I want um, the chief community development officer to be able to expound on all the, the um, rehabilitative projects that you would have um, realized since 2018, because you, have, you would have done a number of community centers Along with that, and, I, and this is something that must be echoed, you have ensured that persons, small contractors within the same communities uh, were given work to build out as a part of the same community empowerment and development, to build out these community centers once they were able to fit um, the, the scope of work um, criteria. And I know that you would have engaged them from within communities so that they would have a sense of uh, understanding that they belong to that very community. That is a part of the philosophy and, and, and policy of the government that once the contracts were under a certain amount, that they must be given to persons in the community. And I know you would have done tremendous work. I want you to be able to give us an update of the amount of work that has been done on community centers since the government come to um, the, the governance and uh, what are some of the new programs that you have initiated since then. Thanks. Thank you, honorable member. Um, you are correct in relation to the importance of community centers on this landscape. Uh, I think the principal youth development officer, uh, Mrs. Titus, would have mentioned the amount of community clubs that were started. And if we are to engage in having these community clubs up and running, then we must have this parallel track where our community centers are available um, to house these um, new groups that were formed by the ministry. Um, Mrs. Keat would have outlined um, a range of 
programs, but I will ask her to come back and, and give you a synopsis of, or, or she can elaborate in terms of what exactly um, you're asking in relation to those community centers that were um, out. Um, she would probably speak to you as well in relation to plans for the sergeant's um, village community center as well. Good evening once again. In relation to the maintenance of community centers, Right, just let me I'm going to answer one question at a time because I am going to give you some stats in relation to the community centers and those which were refurbished. So during the financial year 2021 to 2022, a total of 16 community centers were refurbished at a cost of $1,588,000. 588,661 dollars and of course time permitting I, I can just probably you know give you a brief overview so we did some work at the St. Christopher Resource Center we went there we did some repairs to the roof Parkinson we did some minor repairs there to the exterior the Valley Resource Center in the Glebe one of one of our flagship centers as most of those persons traversing and using the parish of, through the parish of St. George, they're well acquainted with. We had some minor repairs at the Spike Stone Resource Center. And in Bayworths, Bayworths, the roof was leaking then at that point in time, so we sought to address those leaks there. St. Joseph, we did some, and this is the St. Elizabeth Resource Center, we did some repairs to the interior. Deacon's Resource Center, we did major refurbishments down there to a cost of about $200,000. Of course, Grisettes, a center which we had to really approach the repairs there in three phases. The first phase there back in, in that financial year, we would have spent in excess of $200,000 there at that center. And of course, we treated to the Bayville Community Center, had some leaks in the roof, so we sought to have that done. And at that point in time, we also retrofitted the center there in Cyan Hill, so it can offer information technology. Of course, we also did some work at Ellerton. This is the Ellerton Community Center, and we had major upgrades there and Bosque Bell. We conducted two phases there. This is at the Bosque Bell Community Center, where we did a complete refurbishment of that complete facility. So you'll find we have now a facility there where persons can go in and use, and we would not have to treat to any level of maintenance there, just minor maintenance, you know, for a number of years. And of course, the IV Community Center, we did some roof repairs there as well. And we did some major work at Eden Lodge. During the financial year 2022 to 2023, we executed maintenance on 12 community centers at a cost of $1.952 million. And we would have fixed the Rockfield Community Center, which was, as I said earlier today, that was out of use since 2017. So we brought that back into use in 2022. And of course, Parkinson, we went back there because that's a large facility. And we know the, we are supposed to have all of our facilities kept in a good state of disrepair. So we went there, we needed, a, sorry, a good state of repair. And of course, we also ensure that we refurbish the road there, and uh, we have now the table tennis, sorry, the road tennis court there as well. Black Bess, we did some work there at the Black Bess Resource Center, and that, if I must say, that center is due to reopen this week as well. Barrier Hall, we did work there also, and going back to Grisettes, as I said, another phase, and we also continued with work there as well. 
So in addition to that, we've also, for this financial year, we did maintenance at about eight community centers. And uh, of course, the work was slowed down somewhat because we, the maintenance supervisor, he was on extensive sick leave and uh, therefore quite a substantial amount of work. There was some lag time as far as that was concerned. In relation to the other question um, posed in relation to the contracting of the small businesses or small business persons, we have a list of about close to 40 persons who we have employed within this aggressive maintenance program. Um, thanks, Minister. I mean, you start out with, I got a story to tell then. If you go back to the TV series there, it may be a combination of love, lust, and terror. Um, but yours, your story spoke about care. It spoke about hope and vision. Care for the youth of this country. The hope that the sporting facility and, and fraternity, of course, will be returned to those glory days and a vision for community empowerment and development like never seen before. So you already have a good story to tell. Thank you. Thank you, member. Thank you, honorable member. Honorable member, member for St. Michael East. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just want to answer two questions, and I mean, might just put a, some a little some frills around it. Um, I am very concerned about the changing cultural style and interest in sports in Barbados. I, I, I'm hearing a lot about cricket. Um, I know what cricket has done for us since the 1950s. Um, but obviously, the, tre the trends among the sporting communities, one group of persons who had an interest in cricket, that's what my observations are, and another group has an interest in football. The younger people pay more attention to football. The older ones pay attention to cricket. But we have to ask, what we have witnessed in the last few, few years that has caused our people to signal these cultural changes that are existing in the sporting environment across Barbados. Now, I believe that one of the, there are going to be a number of things that need to be touched to improve the conditions. But I am primarily interested in what I consider to be the pathetic decline of BCL cricket. BCL cricket is unique in relation to the other sporting institutions across Barbados. Although the other sporting institutions might open up the door, the BCL represent people right across the various sports clubs at the worker class level, across the entire nation, other little private clubs and so on, um, give, birth, give birth to all the class differentiations that exist in the Barbadian society. I feel the state should do all that it can to make sure we protect the survival of BCL cricket. Whatever injections are required, we should try to protect BCL cricket. The, you have to have some understanding of the significance of BCL, especially when you look to see how 
West Indian cricket and Barbadian cricket in general penetrate the hierarchy so easily as a result of the opening up to the BCL um, unit in helping to give ordinary working class black boys opportunities to be able to play at the first class level. And in many cases went on to show that it has superior creativity and excel as a consequence of BCL. The Ministry of Sports cannot shirk the responsibility to ordinary people in trying to protect BCL. I hardly even hear, I hardly, ever, I hardly ever hear anybody using the, the acronym in modern times. And, 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 and these middle class institutions that emerged in the first, very early in the 1950s and so on, like Carlton and Spartan and, and, and um, a whole set of them, um, wonders. Ordinary people can get into those institutions. But it, need, it needs the, the, the sports council to go beyond how much square feet of land they need for our community center, or how much walls must be built, or what sort of money must be spent. Because you know, talking about the declining of important institutions that gave us a lot of pride, and let us understand that we were capable of beating Great Britain and beating Australia. I know you're seeing the very opposite. Chair, sure, can, I, can I, I, I don't really want to, but Honorable Member, um, I, I know that all of us are busy and different things, but this, this matter was addressed early this morning when I said that the ministry is currently in the process of doing two things. One, um, by the end of this month, you will see a documentary on the BCL. And two, we have plans in train that also maybe by the end of this month, we will start a community-based island-wide program that will seek to resuscitate BCL cricket on island. I, I know you were here. You were not here when I said that, but um, I just wanted to share that with you because I know you're going on about BCL, but this was discussed early this morning in my first mouthings in relation to the BCL. There's a documentary coming from the ministry um, with all of the players who would have passed through the program, those who are now um, administering the BCL, and there's a proposed project that will seek to inject new teams into the BCL. I'm glad to know that you're futuristic. Um, but I was just trying to enlighten you about the significance of the evolution of the BCL and what it meant to the Barbadian public over the years and what that, what that breakthrough meant to all of us and how proud we were about cricket then. So there's not only the functional and the structural approaches but I'm saying that this is also psychosocial and is also sociological, that you must understand the significance of this institution. It is not just like the BCA or it's not like any ordinary institution that emerged. It was born from within the bubbles of the working class. And if people don't understand that, and if the sports council or the government don't try to enlighten the society of the significance of the, the BCL, which has not, never had the prestige of BCA or never had the prestige of some local clubs. So all I'm trying to suggest is that we must also uplift the respect for this, or this institution that came from the bubbles of the earth and the people in Barbados. So I, I would really like to see something done. I don't want it to be a situation where, sir, I know I tell you that I'm going to go on a little, a few frills. Um, I don't want it to be a situation where we're here, and I don't want to cite that as an example of why I put these caveats in, in place. But 
I've heard many programs being enunciated and taking up a lot of time. I don't want to list them on this floor, but none was executed. So I am glad to hear that at least based on the potential that I've heard being expressed about what likely to happen in the future, I am glad to know that this time next year, we will be seeing valuable contributions and injections into the BCL that we can see an improvement in cricket in general in Barbados. All right, so that is, that is the perspective. I've heard the discussion, not only in here, but all on the streets. Now, the other thing that I want to... Sorry, the, I think the minister commented already. What? The, the minister has, has responded... Already. Already. So you may okay. proceed to number two. Well, number two. Number two. Um, and I hope it is not perceived as, is a, it is not being said in a metaphorical sense when I say I'm number two. <laughs> Sir, the honorable member is numerical sense number two. <laughs> number two, yeah. Both numerical and literally. <laughs> Sir, um, I, I am thankful to the Sports Council and the Ministry for putting contemporary structures or infrastructures at Blemings. But I am not pleased with the approach that fundamental changes are being made at Blemings. And I have to wait to I see it in the newspaper or in a really program, or in here, join the estimates, this backbencher. Because backbenchers seem to be synonymous with subordination or inferiority, or not very important in the mainstream of governance. I am saying it to the sports ministry. I am not always going to be responding with this level of passivity to things and changes being made in my community and nobody consulting me. It starts now with me and tomorrow it will be with somebody else. All those who don't want to express these concerns, too bad. But I'm going to express mine and I might not always express mine in the manner in which I do. I've been hearing about setting up special little training units for net practice. I pass in the street. I pass Blemings through the back of I pass Blemings in my lower cell. I didn't know if it was four runs. I don't know what it was. I just passing and looking all the time, and nobody seemed to believe that a backbencher deserved an explanation. I'm only cautioning you, or whoever, that any time you're going to make any fundamental changes in my constituency, the people put me there, and I believe that I should, the discussion should go on with me. This is no top-down approach to government. If you want to put it differently, this is a new democratic order, if you want to put it that way. It has to be... It, we must involve backbenchers or not we will end up being sacrificed at the altar. And I'm not going to be in that position when that special time comes. Just like everybody is looking to go forward in the future, this old man want to go forward too. So I am just asking, informing in the future, blemings, all of a sudden, that is a significant ground. And I hear the discussions in the street about this ministry uh, uh, center. I hear discussions about improving the grounds for special things. I am no wiser. I can't be, I can't be here, sir, for over five terms. 
and listening to anybody telling me that they're doing this, they're doing this up with me, and nobody will consult me. It ain't working. And if you want me to be a happy member of parliament, and want me to be cordial, and not being seen as something acidic, speak with me, please. Speak with me. I don't want to come here and hear about these major developments. I can't say a word because the decisions have been made. I'm not against what is happening there. I am against not informing this representative. If the others want to operate in here and call themselves backbenchers and the cabinet wants to make decisions and anybody else from the top to the bottom wants to make decisions when it comes to St. Michael's East, make the decisions but include my voice because my voice is the voice of the people of the Ivy, Liquid Village, My Lord's Hill, all around there, Howard's Cross, and Martin. That is the area that I represent, and I need to hear about any developments in those specific areas. So, two questions. There's only two questions. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, sir. Um, I, I, I realize that people might be a little uneasy with me. So I, I prefer to just stay at two. Um, honorable member, on behalf of the Ministry Sports Council, I want to apologize to you for not informing you about the work of the Ministry as it relates to the development at Blenheim. I will ensure going forward that um, any developments at that location that you receive correspondence indicating exactly what is happening. Thank you, Minister. I don't. So, so Winston. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for the City of Bridgetown. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is the first time speaking here for a while. I take this opportunity to thank Almighty God, my family, the people of the city of Bridgetown, my colleagues and wider Barbados for the well wishes and kind words, which I thought helped to bring me back to this place much faster than I thought it would. And with that said, I really want to get down to the questions, understanding the time. And I want to start with Emerton. And I've spoken to the minister about Emerton before. And before Gabby has to write a next bestseller, I believe that we need to work out the issues at Emerton Community Center. I've been trying to get there operational for some time. Um, when, I, when I first started, we used to do some baking classes there. We have the Christmas party, et cetera, et cetera. I know all I'm being told is that it's infested with, with rodents. Now, rats don't pay a tax and rats don't pay a rent. So my thing is they need to be given a notice of eviction post haste, and let me get my people back in there. So the people of Chapman Lane and New Orleans wants to know what is happening with Emerton. And I believe in this exercise, it is the best place to have all the questions answered in one place. It's really a one-stop shop. Because where Emerton is considered, I just get a little confused. They tell me that the pastor is managed by the National Sports Council. Downstairs is managed, upstairs is managed by Community Development Department, and downstairs is run by Sports Council. Sports Council don't got keys for downstairs, and like the member for St. Michael South Central, I really, she went and fixed it, she one thing. So if I need to go and fix up my one thing I need to know now, or I need to know what is the plan to get the rodents out and get the constituents back in. That is my first question, Mr. Chair. Thank you, honorable member. Um, yes. We have been um, looking at the redevelopment of that particular location. Um, I also had um, interaction from a police officer in relation to the location. I will ask the sports council first and then Mrs. Keat to respond to you in relation to um, what is being proposed to get that particular location back up and running. But I am aware that because of COVID, the 
rat infestation that you're talking about um, took hold and a lot of equipment at the location that was being used for the same um, baking and culinary um, work had to be um, discarded. But I will allow Sports Council and Mrs. Keat to respond to you. Thank you, um, Minister for the City of Bridgetown, uh, Mr. Lane. I'm glad that you are back in good health as well. Um, in terms of um, Emerton, that really falls under the Community Development Department. And um, we had visited there on a number of occasions, along with Community Development, where we went on a tour. And you are correct, there were issues of bird droppings and, and, and so on and so forth. But we really, Hanif Adam, who is the caretaker there, he really takes care of the field. And uh, he's so magnanimous in that he also assists with community development. But really, um, that facility really falls under the community development department. So uh, it's not much I can speak to. I can speak to Murphy Pasha across the road. <laughs> um, uh, and to say that, if, since I can kill two birds with one stone, that um, we are in the process of um, redeveloping the court, the hard court at Murphy Pasture, um, regrading it, and they put the a tennis court in it as well. So we are fixing up Murphy's Pasture because that pavilion um, belongs to us. But community development, uh, Ms. Keith can speak to. Um, Emerton, thank you. Good evening once again. In relation to Emerton, Emerton Community Center was closed for, this is almost two years, almost two years. We had, uh, as the member for the city did indicate, we had rodent infestation. And uh, we had, uh, we undertook repairs on two occasions, but then we realized that the problems seem to be more challenging than we actually, we were able to deal with at the department. We sought the intervention then of the environmental health officers. So we had that visit two weeks ago, and what we discovered when we were there is that because we did discard a lot of the, the stoves which were in there which were not working, we discarded those, we realized then that we have only one or two areas to actually treat to in order to have that center up and operational. The other challenge there is that we are confronted with some indiscriminate dumping there on that location. So we have sought now to engage the community through a community walkthrough, through, if needs be, a community meeting in order to engage the residents and we are going to partner with the Ministry of Health as far as that initiative is concerned. So in relation to the use of Emerton, we are hopeful that we should be able to have that facility up and functioning in the new financial year. But we are still awaiting because the Ministry of Health, they indicated to us that they're going to give us all of the assistance we need in relation to identifying how we can address the issue of, you know, the rodent infestation, and we would have regular baiting then by the vector control unit so that we are well on top of those situations. But indeed, it has been a very worrisome situation there at the Emerton Community Center because we recognize the importance of having that facility open. I receive calls on numerous occasions in relation to having that facility pressed back into use. But at that time, I indicated to the, to the individuals, because my concern was the rodent infestation, I could not grant center use because the health and safety of center patrons, that is paramount. So with that under control now and some minor repairs, we should be able to have that center up and operational within the next financial year. All right, thank you very much for that. And, and Minister, I know you would take lead on this so I can be comforted 
by the Chief Community Development Officer and also the National Sports Council Director that things will proceed smoothly. So I will leave it at that and need be, and hopefully it will not need to be revisited by either me or by the mighty Gabby. Um, one of the things I want to say on closing that and moving on to my second question is this. Um, on one or two of the study tours that I have taken, and, and this administration is really about transformation, I, I can say I feel a little worried that uh, I know that we are not fully developed, but we talk about being world class. Some of the places I visit, I've seen they have these four-story, 24-hour community centers, multifaceted where you can have pull-out breachers, they can practice, they can have concerts, they can make money, they have areas for NGOs. I would like to see us move towards a new future, a new vision, to have greater vision. If we can be world-class, we have to have world-class facilities. Um, where we are right now, compared to where we need to be, I think that all in the ministry, all in the government, all representatives, all MPs, just start to think about not just how we repair these road problems and this community center too small and this was an old bath, et cetera, et cetera, but how do we get to the promised land? How do we get to what is the pinnacle that can serve the community and young people? The second question I have really is about moving from community to national. I don't know, I think someone touched on this, but ministry were at my branch meeting on Sunday and this came up and people are still asking, so I don't know if it was asked before and it wasn't answered in the way it needed to be answered, but this is about young people I have in my community and in all your constituencies that are part of national teams that smell hell to go and represent this country on national duty. Or in preparation, they have to go into camp so they could gel, so they could represent. Because we want to be here, we want to be proud, and we want to clap, and we want to get the silver. But it is take work and sacrifice to do those things. And I thought that this was a matter that would have been settled before. I know we have a national sports um, policy coming, but I would like the minister you or whoever you designate to answer this, once and for all, what this government and administration plan to do in relation to national players and their representation of national duty in this country, and even pre-national duty when they are asked to come off and go into jail camps where they can jail. My greater concern is the fact that the, one of the parents that complained on Sunday, her son actually works at a, a government institution or a statutory corporation. Um, so that is even more concerning for me. But Minister, I would like you to speak to that specific burning issue which would trouble all of us. Um, sorry, Honorable Member, um, again, this was discussed in detail this morning. The Honorable Member, for St. James North brought chapter and verse to the chamber in relation to this vaccine issue. And he indicated that section 30, I believe, of the Employment Rights Act speaks directly to this, that it is in breach of the law for any um, employer to stop um, one of our national athletes, or sorry, to dismiss or fire one of our national athletes who is representing country of Ireland. So the matter was raised this morning by the Honorable Member for St. James North, where he clearly articulated that it is in the law books, that it is wrong and against the law to dismiss any national athlete who is representing country. Excellent, thank you. The art of politics is repetition. We here this morning, just heard it in the evening. So third and final question, Mr. Chair, it, it goes to really and truly where does the ministry go from here or after estimates? The reason I ask this question is as I go through the estimates, I see that you have quite a tight budget, but a lot of questions, queries, suggestions would have been raised over the few days. And the question is, Minister and your team, what is really your plan now to go back? and to be able to, to restructure based on what colleagues have asked and where you've been challenged or where suggestions have gone. And one particular thing I want to insert there in terms of the ministry, where is the ministry at in relation to data collection and data, an, um, data analytics? And the reason I ask that question is that sometimes you may target a program in a particular place for a particular person, 
but the research may tell you that it needs to be placed in another place for a different person. It's called evidence-driven programming. So for me, where do we go from here and what is the ministry's um, stance on data collection and data analytics to make sure that you have evidence-based programming in the right place for the right person at the right time? Thank you. Thank you for the question, honorable member. Um, when I joined this ministry, I believe in 1995, there was a mantra that this ministry is research driven. Um, yes, you're correct. Director Carter was at the helm at the time. And I, I want to suggest to you that all of these years later, um, it is still a case where the ministry is research driven. Uh, we have the School Leavers Traces Survey that is done every single year to gather information from those six formers or fifth formers who are exiting the school system. And we do this at every single secondary school to ascertain what are their needs, what are their concerns, what are their aspirations in terms of their future. Uh, we then look at that information. It is analyzed and programs are put in place to ensure that some of the things that they would have identified are coming to fruition as a result of programming from the ministry. So that, that is standard as it relates to what we're doing in the ministry. Um, the recent block committee and Project Dawn, they're also collecting information across the blocks on this island to find out from those individuals what it is that they want to do, how can we facilitate their needs, what type of programs we need to go back and do to ensure that they are reintegrated, like I mentioned before, into mainstream society. So the research aspect of the ministry is solid. It is in existence, and it will remain that way as it relates to programming. In terms of sports, there are a couple of projects, initiatives that we are looking to roll out um, that we believe can benefit our target population. At the facilities at Wilde, we're now in the process of doing a couple of things. There's the 400 track that should be started sometime in the new financial year. There's a badminton facility that should be started as well in the new financial year. If you go to the location, you will see that the um, beach volleyball facility is in the, uh, probably the final stages before we can bring that um, up as well. The ministry would have provided an opportunity for those youngsters who are involved in sports and need to showcase their talent maybe to a coach who is in the US or wherever. There's a portal, a portal at the National Sports Council where we can upload um, videos from those youngsters to, to send to a particular coach who would be interested in that. The ministry would have provided a, um, a wellness center at the, gym, the Wilde Gymnasium for all national federation members who are interested in engaging in um, strength um, development. So th these are some of the programs, honorable member, that are coming on stream through the ministry to ensure that we stay relevant for the young people of this country. You would have heard um, about the summer camps program that is coming, the, 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 the national um, youth captains program that is coming. So we are currently engaging in um, looking at what we can do to ensure that young people in this country remain relevant. Uh, we're rolling out cultural programs. You would have heard the principal youth development officer mention um, the digital project that had some persons, the camp where persons were able to um, win medals at NIFCA. There's a lot going on within the ministry that is geared towards ensuring that we have, um, as the Prime Minister would say, those global um, citizens. So there's a lot that is on the card for this financial year and going forward at the ministry. I hope that I was able to shed some light in terms of what we're doing in terms of research, um, follow-up, and new initiatives. 
Thank you. We, we share a lot. We will continue to share a lot. We, we have some data that we will share with you, and hopefully you have some you can share with us um, in, in the program, the National Crime Prevention Program, where, like, where we see where crime is coming from and where crime is occurring and from within the prison and so on. So we'll share that going forward. I just want to close by saying that for me, for 26 years, I've been an advocate for youth and youth work. And I've always asked for more. And Minister, I'm proud today for you and your team to say that y'all have brought more. I've always asked more from, from being a, a youth parliamentarian. And I believe that this country needed to reach at this stage where it, it is a good place and a good time to be a young person. And that is the story in Barbados today. Um, any critic can say anything. There's always room for improvement because unless you have perfection, there will always be room for improvement. So I want to close by congratulating the ministry sincerely, not just self-congratulation, but I want to congratulate the ministry on a fantastic job, particularly over the last financial year. And to say, closing, my sincere condolences to the team. I know what it is for morale and different things like that. I give you my sincere condolences from me and on behalf of the people of the city of Bridgetown. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Member for St. Joseph. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't propose to be um, too long. And of course, um, I had other matters attended to this morning, so um, I might be in the same position as the other honorable member who was told that the answer was already given. Uh, though I doubt very much that the answer to my question about St. Joseph will have been given already. Um, St. Joseph has the benefit probably of more community facilities than any other, any other constituency in Barbados. Um, uh, we have, and they say constituency and not parish. Uh, we have three pavilions. We have um, two sets of, three sets of hard courts and, and other facilities. The challenge though, uh, Mr. Minister that I face, or that my constituents face, is the absence of what I could only consider to be planned maintenance. Um, to get to the point, really, the pavilion at Lammings was condemned by the National Sports Council in 2021. Uh, as a result of the pavilion being condemned, the ability of the community to use the field has been significantly hampered. And as a result, um, the quality of the field now is in peril. It hasn't been maintained. Um, one of the young men who used to be actively the groundsman um, simply doesn't do it anymore because there's no pavilion and therefore sport and activity at that facility is also, well, is no significantly diminished. So um, my, my principal question really is, what is the plan for the rebuilding of a pavilion at Lammings? Lammings is a very densely populated area. It is an area with a lot of young people, a significant amount of challenges. Um, but without that facility, we're not seriously going to be addressing some of the difficulties. And just to get straight through it, Mr. Chairman, I have also to ask about um, the fact that the hard court in Church Village needs rings, but the Sports Council seems not to check back these things. Um, similar criticism has to be made of the hard court in Bathsheba. The actual surface um, is, has deteriorated over the years, but no attention has been paid to it. I appreciate only too well the challenges that a constituency like mine presents. Your rain falls every day, you have slippage and so on that 
compounds the difficulty. Uh, but we can't bury our heads in the sand. And I, I therefore raise this issue in the interest of my constituents who are very concerned at what appears to be a level of decay that is not seen in other places. Uh, thank you for the questions, Honourable Member. So you mentioned Church Village. Where is that in St. Joseph? By the church. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, is, it is the area that we call, uh, in the area of the St. Joseph Parish Church, it's called Church oh, Village. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So this is a hard court right opposite. On the horse hill. In the middle. But right opposite the old parish church. Right, okay. All right. Um, I hear your concerns. I will ask the director of the Sports Council to respond to you. Um, I am familiar with the, the pavilion at Lamins because wearing another hat in the ministry, I was um, present when Hillary would have organized to have the prefab uh, place at the location. But I'll ask the director to speak to the areas that you have identified in St. Joseph. Director? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Honorable Member for St. Joseph. And um, your concerns we know about, and they're, they're well noted. Um, the pavilion at Lamins, as you rightly said, um, had um, deteriorated to the point that um, it had to be con closed and condemned. Um, we already have it in our um, plans for the next financial year, 2021-2024-2025. Um, we require the drawings and, uh, and approval. Um, but we have, um, I think, if my memory serves me right, there was an the initial cost you know, of about $1.6 million or thereabouts for that pavilion. But we have that in the, in the financial, for the financial year. 2024-2025, the uh, hard court at Church Village, as you call it, I think we have another name for it, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, we think it was Vaughn's Road or something like that, or something like that, but around there, um, Horace Hill. Um, we know that the basketballers had gone up to Grant Adams um, to, to play the basketball, but we have asked um, C.O. Williams for the, um, the regret um, for that facility right there um, um, by opposite the church. Um, so we've asked C.O. Williams for a cost and a grade on that with a view within the financial year of bringing that back into, into play. And I think the last one you spoke about was St. Elizabeth Bathsheba. Um, we are actively reviewing that as well um, for the financial year. Um, as I had indicated um, earlier, um, we are working with um, a depleted budget. We're working um, with a net of $1.1 million, um, but we are finding ways to make it happen, and that's what the Sports Council is about. Um, you're not passive, you're not static, and uh, we understand that the development is paramount um, in this country for the young people, especially sports, and uh, therefore, we are working um, assiduously to try to ensure that the constituents are happy. Thank you. And their representative, of course. Thank you. Honorable member for St. Michael Southeast. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A pleasant good afternoon to um, you, Minister, and to your entire team. Uh, let me say from the outset, I share a number of the similar concerns of my colleagues, albeit that perhaps my approach has been slightly different somewhat to the, the viewing of the Ministry of, of Youth and Community Development and Sports, in that I see the ministry as a facilitator, similar to the Ministry of Culture. It is not the savior of all things related to youth or sporting facilities or the solutions in terms of all of our issues within communities. I think it requires a, a thought that while the ministry facilitates the 
responsibility of the businesses within communities um, to play a role in helping to develop sporting activities in, in these areas is ab an absolute necessity. Um, as one of the ministers said earlier, the $2,500 that we are provided cannot in any way do a lot of the activities, whether in sports or in a lot of aspects of the community. And therefore, the reliance is on corporate entities, on our own resources, on the government resources, but also on community development and sports to be able to help to facilitate programs that ministers and MPs would like to see within the community. Minister, I am... Um, often a critic, but I must say that I've enjoyed the relationship that I've had with your ministry, and this is even preceding you as minister. And maybe it is because I approach it as though we are partners, um, we are working together, um, we try to identify what the issues are, what the young people would like to do within the community. And I can say that with the introduction of, I think it is the Youth Development Officers, um, St. Michael's Office has benefited considerably from a number of the programs that in the last few years have been offered um, to the residents of my community. And it has been able to impact in such a way that, I mean, there are so many programs now that I see young people participating in. In particular, the Parkinson Resource Center, um, which uh, was redone by the Maria Holder Trust in, in conjunction with the ministry, um, is now a hive of activity once again. We had a lot of concerns because this community's facility uh, was one certainly that for many, many years was a hive of activity. And then once the repairs were needed and they'd been left abated for a long time, once that was done, we're starting to see now the, the um, uptick in activities there. And I, I do appreciate the support that has been given by your ministry in relation to that facility. I am mindful, Minister, that you know all of us, all 20, 30 of us in here um, will ask questions regarding specific, more parochial matters. Um, so while I, I boast of the Parkinson Resource Center, I'm mindful that in the constituency, I have other facilities as well that I believe are not as equally attended to. And I want to raise one which I would hope that you or your team can respond to, um, the Meadow Road facility. It is a facility quite near to the Stokes and Mike Brighton Stokes um, area in Wildey. Um, in the last year, I believe, the facility was closed for renovations to take place. Um, we'd been in discussions in relation to um, a, a corporate entity with an interest in being able to um, help to develop that particular space and to help to build out a, a new um, facility. And I just wanted to know, um, for the benefit of the residents of St. Michael's Southeast, where are we with that particular proposal? Because while I know that you are actively working on it, um, it has been almost over a year, and we have not actually had the use of the actual pavilion at that location. The field, you can use the field, but I think that while the process has to take place to, to acquire the permissions, a community obviously has nowhere to really engage in competitive sports or to be able to use an actual recreational space on evenings, whether young people or, or elderly. And so I would like an update um, as it relates to the, this year's estimates and whether provision has actually been made to take into account the upgrade of the Meadow, Hall, Meadow Road facility in Wildey. Uh, thank you for the question, Honourable Member. I will ask the Director to respond to you. Thank you, uh, Minister. Thank you, Member, for um, the constituency of St. Michael's Southeast. Indeed, um, we spoke to the NSCS facilitator, um, but over the last year, you have been at the vanguard of being the facilitator between the National Sports Council and the residents. I remember a couple of evenings where we met with the members of the constituency regarding the same pavilion and including some very young children there who were gung-ho um, about some of the sports they wanted to engage in, boxing and so on and so forth. And um, we have uh, had uh, drawings there at, um, at the facility. Um, we have sent those drawings to the Planning Development Department um, for approval. We haven't gotten them back as yet. But what we will see there is uh, an enhanced facility um, which will uh, have both sporting and entrepreneurship um, as part and parcel of its makeup. Um, in addition to uh, facilitating uh, the uh, hard courts, regrading the hard courts, 
Um, we are just um, awaiting, and we really couldn't do any th anything much there at the facility um, until those plans um, uh, got approved. We also are working, as you indicated, with a corporate entity in the area um, towards the total development of not only the playing field, but that particular facility as well. So I can say to you at this point, um, Minister and the constituents, that the Sports Council is working hand in glove with the, uh, the, the, the Minister for the constituency and uh, we are waiting the approval for the start implementation of works there for the facility at Meadow Road. Thank you. I want to thank you, Mr. Merle, for the, the update. Um, and just to say that I do feel the time has now come for us to have not just a national policy on sports, but we also need to have a Sports Development Act as well to be able to govern the incentives that are necessary for the corporate entities, for individuals, for charities, um, for people living in a diaspora who may want to identify with a particular project in a community and be able to support that by way of financial support. Um, the project of which you speak, um, again, without saying too much, is, is again in keeping with how I view the, 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 your ministry. And I believe that there are lots of opportunities out there for corporate entities and individuals to be able to support the programs of your ministry. But what may be required at this point is perhaps as you move towards having the actual legislation put in place and drafted, which I know will take some time, maybe having a dedicated officer who starts to look at the types of projects that could perhaps be of interest to persons wanting to invest within communities. We have a number of people in the diaspora who are interested in giving back to Barbados. Um, in the tourism, under the tourism head, I would have raised the issue of volunteerism. And that is an area as well that I think can also benefit the, the Ministry of Sports um, and certainly youth in terms of the identification of projects which may be of interest to people. Um, it is a concept, I think, that it can work for education, and we've, we've done a lot of work with the diaspora in education with the volunteerism. Um, we've also seen the benefits of it in tourism. And I would urge you to start to explore, perhaps identifying a number of the projects that are across various constituencies that you would want to engage in, and perhaps engage more with, with, with these individuals and companies to see if they are interested in matching what government is doing. Because there is no way that we will be able to, to, to achieve the wish list um, that we all have in this space um, for the development and the future development of sports in this country. But I think the sports development incentive legislation would be a good starting point and it would help to build on what you currently have in terms of an actual framework and policy um, for sports in this country as well. The, the other area, um, Minister, that I would want you perhaps to touch on is the concept for the Map Hill Pavilion. Because again, this is one of the older pavilions. Um, I, I am pleased to say that I am the product of a legacy in St. Michael's Southeast, where my father who was a former minister of sports um, and representative for the community of St. Michael's Southeast, heavily invested in the entire sporting discipline. And a, a, the name Bradshaw became synonymous with every sporting activity and discipline across that community. So whether it was football boots, um, whether it was basketballs, whether it was the erection of lights across the constituency, my father would have been at the forefront of that. And I believe that the Map Hill Pavilion, which is what I consider is the center, it's like a mecca in the country. It serves not just St. Michael Southeast, but it serves the St. George area. It also serves the St. Philip area as well, because everybody uses that particular um, field. Um, it has been well maintained over the years, and I do feel that the time has now come for us to be able to develop that um, and to its full potential. And I would want to hear whether you have any plans for that facility. I know the, the stadia was one of, it was identified for one of the mini stadia, but I would like to know what is the status of those plans for this financial year. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, Director, can you respond please? Uh, thank you, Minister. Yes, um, we had a concept um, proposal um, that uh, we are looking at in terms of Map Hill. 
Um, we have not included it, though, in the, the next financial year, but we will work to see how we can build out that concept into something more meaningful as we approach the next financial, the following financial year. Um, but we will, uh, that, that concept had a lot of things in it, swimming pools and so on and so forth. But um, we didn't include it this year, but um, we will look during the interim period to see how we can um, look at ha having an implementable project going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And just lastly, just to follow on from the honorable member who spoke prior to my joining the session. Um, as it relates to maintenance, I think we've heard a lot about the maintenance um, of the facilities generally um, in the course of this, this discussion on the head. Um, and I hear the plans that are in place for the maintenance of the facilities. And this is more perhaps not so much of a question because I think you, we've exhausted what you're doing in terms of maintenance. Um, but it's more by way of comment. I think we have reached that point where across ministries, we are, have not been very good at addressing the issue of maintenance. Um, as Minister of Public Works, I can tell you, I have I've had my own challenges and, and I've made it very public what those challenges have been from time to time. But I do feel that given all of the concerns that have been raised here and that are raised almost every year in relation to the estimates um, under this head, perhaps that time has now come for us to, in a sense, outsource a lot of the works that um, we have heard are of concern to communities. And in so doing, being able to have the ministry provide more oversight over the persons that are engaged to be able to um, do the facilities, management of the facilities. Um, it is difficult, I know, because in many cases you don't have the resources to be able to do all of the 30, the 30 um, MPs who are calling on you constantly. But I think that the we've seen the benefits certainly in roads, being able to do some of the outsourcing and to have the ministry staff provide oversight. And I think that the time has now come for us, not across every single ministry, but I think there are key ministries where we may get a better um, outcome across the maintenance of our facilities if we are able to you know, rationalize the existing staff and allow them to oversee, set the specifications for what is, is required across each community, and then work systematically to be able to have those plans unfold. Um, of course, that requires resources, but I think once you're able to streamline, the plans that you've outlined, Minister, I think would be far more effective if there is a dedicated team that is simply looking at the maintenance of the structures across the communities. You have introduced what you term the center management. Um, we've benefited from it in St. Michael Southeast. Um, the community residents get involved in actually running the facility uh, along with community development officers. And that for the most part has worked well. But I think we need to now expand that as well to allow persons to become more involved in making these facilities, not just 24 hours, but as, as long as they possibly can be open to facilitate the elderly and young people across the communities. So I again commend you. It's been, I know it's been difficult for this ministry as well. This government has had to focus um, considerably on you know, keeping the economy stable. Um, and in many cases, we've not been able to focus heavily on the area of sports or community development. I think now is the time where you have a perfect opportunity in the ministry to be able to build on the last few years and to really catapult sports and sporting initiatives in the country, as well as to help to improve a number of the communities. So thank you, Minister. Thank you, Minister, for your words. Um, and I agree with you. And we have started to outsource in some areas um, so I will take to heart a lot of what you would have suggested. Honorable Minister, you would have your opportunity to wrap up after you have um, responded to these questions which I'm raising on behalf of the constituency of St. Thomas, since their MP is not in a position to do so. First, and I'll, I'll say all three one time. The first query is with respect to the social center at Rock Hall St. Thomas, which was taken out of operation in 1987 for the, for the um, facilitation of construction of the District D police complex. 
um, the residents there now have no facility and a report on update or status report is being requested as to what is happening there. In addition, Hill House Center at Dumscombe Hill. Hill House Center at Dumscombe Hill. It is in their need of upgrade. It facilitates several residents from Canfield and Spring Farm and Pori Spring, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there is a request, this third one, for lights at the Holy Innes Pavilion with respect to when you are constructing the mini city. Honorable Minister, you may respond, and immediately after you respond, you can, your response, you can do your wrap up and move the head. All right, thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to these questions, I will ask um, Mrs. Keith from CDD to look at or speak to the Rock Hall and the Dumbscum issue, and Mr. Matthias to speak to the concern at Holy Innocent. Good evening once again. In relation to the facility at the at Rock Hall St. Thomas, that facility is a facility we took over the management of just under two years. We've started the, the process of, we have the plans for the refurbishment of that facility, but we confronted one or two issues in relation to seeking the services of a quantity surveyor. We reached out to the Ministry of Transport and Works, and they were assisting us up to earlier this year, but certainly, from what I understand, they do have their challenges, and the decision was then made that we would outsource those services, the services of a QS. So at this point, I can say that the, we started the gutting of the facility, the interior, because that was required, so we can have an assessment then. So we are at the phase now where we would employ the services of a quantity surveyor who would then advise us in relation to the cost or proposed cost of the refurbishment. But the refurbishment of that facility was placed in the estimates for this financial year. We allocated $200,000 to start that first, the first phase of that work. Good afternoon once again. Um, re in response to the question at Holy Innocence, um, first let me say that it's Bridgefield that has the mini stadium. Um, currently work is being done there for the mini stadium aspect. Holy Innocence was part of the original lighting pro um, project where we put six light poles there. Um, well, we put five. The sixth one was being put in place and the cricket team um, had requested a meeting where the honorable member who's not here um, would have facilitated that meeting. And an agreement was made where we will try to shift that six pole um, off site, which is land that the Sports Council does not own. So the process is we are trying to um, get permission from the, the owners of that piece of land to place the extra six pole there um, to facilitate where it was uh, initially was a hindrance to what the um, cricket team and the school actually had wanted because it impacted the field. And it's situated in such a way that there is a right of way on the north side of the field that is impacting on where we situate that pole. So um, with approvals, we will be able to put up that final pole at all in instance and get that project finished in totality. Chair, um, on Friday, when I started this, I said that I had a story to tell. Um, late Tuesday, I am pleased to say that along with my team, the story was told. It is not... Be before you move on, Honorable Min before you wrap up, Honorable Minister, mm -hmm. I didn't hear 
might have missed it, the response with respect to Hill House. Ooh. Hill House at Dunscombe Hill. The facility, Hill House Center at Dunscombe Hill. Um, Ms. Key? In relation to the Hill House project, that was, from what I gather and from the research, that was a private facility really donated to a group there. We had discussions, I think that was two years ago, but I have not seen from the Community Development Department, I have not seen a request, or a request was not submitted in relation to any financial assistance or any, any type of funding for the upkeep of that facility. But certainly if, like with all of the others, um, all of the other requests, if that is a request coming from the Member of Parliament for St. Thomas, the Community Development Department, we would certainly see how we can address that. Thank you, Honorable Minister. You may proceed with your wrap up. Thank you, Chair. As mentioned before, the story was told. Um, it is evident from the submissions, the questions that came from the honorable members that they too had a story um, to tell in relation to the function of the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment. Um, our goal, Chair, is to empower our young people to build a cohesive society um, through full involvement of the youth and communities, and I think that we are well on our way to doing that. Um, every single day we come to work at the ministry to be proactive in terms of delivering the services that I know our young people uh, require of us. And government is putting the necessary resources um, on an annual basis, and, and this financial year coming is no um, exception. And we will seek to empower we will seek to do that thing that I mentioned again, facilitate the needs and aspiration of all of our young people. If we're asking them to fly, then we must give them the wings and the ministry is well placed to ensure that we have success at every single level. We continue to all, um, unfold and to unroll new programs that we think will be interactive, new programs that will capture the attention of our young people. Um, it is, it is interesting, like I said initially, that I had a target for the next financial year that we now have to revisit in terms of the number of people that we will seek to train in the ministry in various disciplines. Um, we continue to expand, and that is the mantra for this financial year, to expand as many of our programs through satellite locations as possible. So I look forward to new things, scaling new heights, bringing new initiatives to the young people of this country during the financial year 2024-2025. With that, Chair, I beg that Head 91 stand par. The question is that Head 91 Stand apart, all honorable members in favor, say aye. Honorable members against, say no. We think the ayes have it. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Mr. Chairman, I beg to move that you do not report progress to her honor, the Deputy Speaker. The question is that I do not report progress to her honor, the Deputy Speaker. On one, on the and ask for leave to sit again. All honorable members in favor, say aye. All honorable members against, say no. We think the ayes have it.
Honorable members, Chairman has reported progress and has asked for leave again. Honorable members, if it, wait, thank you, pardon, ma'am. Thank you, Honorable Leader of Government's Business. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I beg to move the suspension of the House until tomorrow, the 13th of March at 9.30 a.m. Question is that this Honorable Chamber resume its session tomorrow, be suspended until tomorrow, the 13th of March at 9.30 a.m. Honorable members in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say no. Me thinks the eyes have it. This, this, this session stands suspended until tomorrow, March the 13th at 9.30 a.m.